Philippians chapter 1, please. If you would open your Bibles, por favor. We've prayed, we've given our time to the Lord, we've asked him to bless our time together, so let's get into the word for today. I've entitled our time together, Your Test Can Be Your Testimony. It's how you view it. It's how you perceive your, your trial, your test. Stories told. The dad has two sons, eight, nine, ten years old. Twins. One of them is the proverbial classic pessimist. Nothing ever goes right. Everything's always down. Everything's always bad. Can't make him happy. Always complaining. On the other hand, his other son, proverbial classic optimist. Nothing ever goes wrong. <laughs> Don't you hate people like that? <laughs> Everything's always right. I'm just always happy. So the dad says, I, I got to do something about this. The, the pessimist, he, I can't let him just grow up this way. He's got to learn a lesson that there's good things that happen. So what he does is he goes to a store, electronic store, and, and buys all the newest electronic gadgets, Xboxes, uh, Playstations, the newest iPads, the newest computers, the up-to-date everything, and puts it inside of his room. The little boy comes home from school and he says, son, I got a surprise for you. You're going to like this. The little boy opens the door. He sees all of this new electronic stuff that any child would just love. And he, he sees this sadness come over his face. Son, what is the matter? Que pasó? <laughs> oh, dad. When I start playing these things, they're going to be out of date in about three months. What? Well, let me try the optimist and let, let me see if I can help him understand that not everything is always cheery and a bowl of cherries, that sometimes life hands you a, a difficult time, comes up with an idea. He finds himself, you know those when you buy a refrigerator, sometimes they'll be in a big, huge cardboard box, a big refrigerator-sized cardboard box. And he goes to a local feed store and he fills the back of his truck with horse manure. <laughs> and he fills up this refrigerator-sized box with horse manure. And his thought is, when my son can ha comes home and he sees that, he's going to see sometimes life stinks. <laughs> sometimes life is not that good. So he muscles this box into the boy's room, stacks it full of steer manure. He says, son, come in here, I got something for you. He opens the door and the boy looks at this box and he can see that it's full of steer manure or horse manure. And the boy begins to roll up his sleeves. And the dad's watching him going, what? In? And he's rolling up his sleeves. <laughs> and the boy goes over to the box that's full of horse manure. And he takes his raw hands and he's digging through the horse manure. And there's horse manure flying in every single direction. And the boy and the dad says, Stop! What are you doing, Dad? With all this horse manure, there's got to be a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> Perspective. You ever think that there might be a pony in your problem? You ever even consider it? The challenges that you and your husband are having that have been going on for so long, could it be that there's a pony in there somewhere? The teenage child that you have, or, or young man, young woman, that just doesn't seem to be interested in the thing, in fact, they're going away from the Lord. 
Could there be a pony in there? Can you imagine that? <laughs> I had one parent come to me years and years ago. My child, my 17-year-old is out of control. I don't know what to do. He won't pay attention. He's always in jail, and he's doing drugs. And I kind of smirked, and he goes, I don't think it's funny. I think he'll probably be a Calvary Chapel pastor one day. <laughs> Look at Pastor John. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> when you think of perspective, the first person that comes to my mind, and we're going to go through, it's just three verses that we'll be looking at. But when you, when you think of perspective, don't you think of Joseph in the book of Genesis? And Joseph, the Lord shows him a vision. You're going to, your brothers and your father are going to be bound down to you one day and you're going to do great things. And next thing you know, Joseph is um, hated by his brothers and eventually thrown into a pit, then sold as a slave. And I wonder, what was his perspective? What was he thinking? Wow, wait a minute, I thought, I thought there was a pony in here. I've been thrown into a pit. They pull him out, they sell him into slavery. He leaves his homeland to head off to Egypt. And it's there that he gets hired by the governor, Potiphar. And he's, the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph. You gotta remember that, and it's there that the wife of the governor tries to seduce Joseph and he does the godly thing, he flees. And she accuses him of attempted rape and the result is he gets thrown in prison. Senor, what happened? I trusted you. I believed that you were calling me. I believed that you had a plan. But look, I'm in jail and I, and I didn't do anything. I did the right thing thing. Perspective. And it's a whole series of events, but he interprets a, the dream for a cupbearer, and the dream comes through. He told him, he says, you're going to be restored back to your position, and they come and they take the cupbearer, and they restore him back to the position, but Joseph says, hey, 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 listen, when you stand before the king, don't forget me. I did a good thing for you. And so the cub bear is restored to his position. And what do you think the cub bear did? He forgot him. Abandoned him. Not just for a day, a week, a month. I picture Joseph sitting in the prison cell, having been placed there unfairly, unjustly. Oh, the cub bear is going to come down and I'll hear the rattling of the keys and I'll be set free soon. Two years, he forgot him. And it was at the end of the two years, it was a dream that got him in trouble to begin with. At the end of the two years of imprisonment, the king has a dream and he can't interpret it and nobody can interpret it. And then all of a sudden the cupbearer goes, oh man, I forgot. Ay, Dios mío, there's a guy in prison. And he can interpret the dream for you. They shave him, they wash him, they bring him, and he's standing there in front of the king. And, 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 and I, can picture, I can picture in my wicked mind, the king is there and Joseph is there, having been forgotten and abandoned by man for two years. And the cupbearer that forgot him is sitting right there. And I can imagine the king talking to Joseph. Hey, I understand that you can uh, interpret dreams. And I picture Joseph looking at the cupbearer. <laughs> Muchas gracias. <laughs> and listen to the perspective. After all of that, Joseph says, I can't. But I serve a God. And he's able. Any of those adjectives point to you? Abandoned, forgotten, treated unfairly. He didn't do anything wrong. 
but they treated you unfairly. How do you see it? Could there be a pony in there somewhere? Or, or is it just stinks? I want us to look at three verses in which the Apostle Paul speaks to us about perspective. And what we'll do is we'll look at several examples of the way that I believe we ought to be looking at our situations from different people that we read about in the scriptures. In, in verse 11, we read in Philippians chapter 1, I'm sorry, verse 12. I'm going to read the three verses. I want you to know, brothers, and underline this, the things, underline the word things, the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace car and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brothers in the Lord have become confident by my chains. And they are much more bold to speak the word without fear. I, I, I wrote this down. I don't know if you take notes, if you like to take notes, but I, I wrote this down. In verse 12, your perception of God determines your perspective of, uh, the perspective of your problems, the perspective of your problems. How do you view God? How do you see him? How, what's your thoughts about him? What, you, know, what, you have a relationship, but where is your intimate fellowship with him that you're getting to know him for who he is? Or are you just angry at him? How could you do this to me? God, how could you allow this to happen? Why would you treat me this way? Why would you let these people talk to me like this? In the Gospel of Mark and, and, and uh, Luke and, and Matthew, there's a story about the disciples. And, and what's interesting is that Jesus says to the disciples, I want you to get into the boat and listen to what he says, because we are going over to the other side. The Lord has spoken. Jesus didn't say, get into the boat because we're going to go under halfway through. No, he, he already told them, we're going to make it. We're going to arrive. And between the time that, God, that Jesus told them that to the time they arrived, there was a massive storm that came up in the Sea of Galilee. A furious storm came up immediately, unexpectedly. They were experienced fishermen. Now, I, I, I grew up in the desert, Las Vegas, Nevada. I've been in Florida for 38 years, but I'm still, I'm not a big water person. Didn't help them when we first moved to uh, Fort Lauderdale in 1985. I almost drowned in the ocean. That didn't help any. So I'm still more of a desert person. But I do know this. You want the boat on the water, not the water in the boat. I know that much. And so the disciples, these experienced fishermen, are crying out. They're afraid. We're going to drown. We're going to drown. What was Jesus doing on the stern of the little boat? He had taken a my pillow. 2.0, and he had said it there, good night, we're going to make it. Don't you care? Now, it's one thing, it's one thing that the disciple says, Lord, save us. That's good. That's what we're supposed to do. But they didn't stop there. Comma, we're going to drown. So here's what's happening. Be careful with this. Don't let 
your problem determine your view of God? Because that's what we do. The size of their test, the size of the waves, the strength of the wind overshadowed the greatness of their God. They let that happen. Don't let that happen. But let me give you a, a few names of people that I just, I want to meet these folks. When, when, when I get to heaven, I want to meet these folks and I want to ask them, how would you do that? How were you able to keep that focus? How were you able to maintain that perspective? The first one, Job. Who doesn't want to meet Job? He'll be the one that has boils on his body. He suffered. But it was Job in Job chapter 23 and verse 10. Listen to this perspective. He says in Job chapter 23 and verse 10, God knows me. God knows me, and he knows the way that I take. Watch what he says. And after I have been tested, I'm going to come forth like gold. Listen to that perspective. He could have said, after I've been tested, I'm going to be angry, and I'm going to just walk away from God. No. You see, I... After I've been tested, the purpose of my testing is that God's going to refine me. God loves me. He's with me. He knows me. And he's working everything out for my good. And so the test that he's allowing in my life is that I may be strengthened. I want to come forth as gold. I want to sit on a cross from Job and go, tell me, how did you do that? Job chapter 13, though he slay me, I will yet praise him. Oh, how I want to be that kind of person. The Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. A perspective. Paul, how did you do this? Tell me. What did you know that I didn't know? What did you, what did you understand that I didn't understand that through your problems you had heavenly perspective? In my problems, I'm falling apart. It, 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 nothing's working. It'll never change. Second Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul says, Brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed about the problems that I went through in the province of Asia. I was under great pressure. And this is what he says. So much so that I was fearing for my life now, that's a bad day when, when you're saying, it was so bad, I could have died. And then he says this, but this happened. Listen to the perspective. But this happened that I might learn how to trust in God and not in myself. <laughs> Why don't I have that perspective? I was under great pressure. It looked impossible, so I threw a fit and I panicked, and I got angry, and I screamed, and I accused people of mistreating me. Paul says, listen, the reason this happened is that the Lord, that I might learn how to trust in the Lord. What an amazing thing. In the next few chapters, in, in the next few chapters in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the perspective, the Apostle Paul says, we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. Outwardly, we're wasting away. How many of you that are getting older, you go, amen. <laughs> amen. I, I get up in the mornings from bed, and it takes me 45 minutes to make it from the bed just to the bathroom. <laughs> this hurts, that hurts. I went to bed one night feeling really good. And when I woke up, I threw my back out. During sleep. I was asleep and I threw my back out. We don't lose heart. 
Though outwardly we're wasting away, listen to the perspective, but inwardly I'm being renewed day by day. Listen to the perspective. These light, if you know the life of the Apostle Paul, you know that he was shipwrecked, he was flogged, he was dragged through the city, he was thrown into prison, he was beaten with sticks, he was beaten with uh, his people's fists, they punched him. And he says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, these light and moment troubled, uh, momentary troubles that I'm facing don't compare with the glory that is going to be revealed one day. <laughs> what kind of perspective is that? Paul, how do you do that? I would have called fire down from heaven and these people that were mistreating me like that. <laughs> these light and momentary troubles are achieving for us. They're doing something. These troubles are doing something. These problems I'm having, these challenges I'm having, they're going ahead of me up into heaven. And, and, and because I'm having the right perspective, they're achieving something for me. My problems that I face here on earth, they're actually going ahead of me and working for me. And they're attaining for me a glory that far outweighs any trial I ever went through here on this earth. What perspective? And then he says, so, I don't focus on the things that are seen because those things are unseen. Those things are temporal. I focus on the things that I don't see. Those are unseen because those are eternal. What incredible perspective. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul once again, this struck me with such incredible perspective. And his life, if you know his life, man, it was not an easy life. He walked away from so much. In prison, in the island of Malta, bitten by a viper, and going through shipwrecks and floating on the sea for two weeks, hanging on to a plank. Why? Because he was on his way to share the gospel. And he says in Romans chapter 5, I rejoice in my suffering. <laughs> what? You got my attention right away. What do you mean you rejoice in your suffering? Because, because the suffering is producing perseverance in my life. If I will have the right perspective during my testing, if I will bring God into the picture, if I, I will include the work of the Holy Spirit during my testing, I rejoice in my suffering because my suffering is producing perseverance. And this perseverance, when I let it do its work, it's producing in me character. And this character, if I allow it to do its work, it's producing in me hope. And this hope doesn't disappoint me. Do you know why he says this hope doesn't disappoint me? Because God has poured out his love into my heart through his spirit that he's given us. Paul has a way of always connecting his suffering, his test, his difficulty. God's working. God's doing something. Three chapters later, Romans chapter 8, in verse 18, I consider, he says, I consider this present suffering that I'm going through not worthy to compare with the glory that waits me. Do you have that kind of insight into your life? The problems that you face, the testing of your faith, the difficulties that you have, do you ever, do you ever just bring God into the picture and go, God's doing something. Thank you, God. You're treating me as your child. When you think of second, uh, uh, the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk, I can't wait to meet him. I can't wait to talk to him. Habakkuk, I got some questions, man. I want to know how you did it. 
Because in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17 and 18, he's going through a hard time. Babylonians are coming. There's challenges happening. And he must have sat back one day and just reviewed his life. In my opinion, in my opinion, just kind of reviewed his life. God, you've been so good to me. It's tough right now. Going through some bad times right now. But then in chapter 3, in verse 16, 17, and 18, Habakkuk says this. Though the fig tree does not bud, and if I go outside to my grapevine and there's no grapes, there's no grapes on the vine, so I go check my olive tree. There's no olives on the tree. I go out to my field and the, the, the field is producing nothing. I, I go out to my, my, my pens where the sheep are supposed to be and, and, and the, the pens are empty. There's no sheep. So I try the stalls where the cattle is supposed to be and I go and... and there's no cattle in the stalls. And so he begins by saying, if the worst thing that ever could happen to me happened, and I lost everything, my ability to make money, my ability to provide for my family, I lose all my uh, 503C or 401Ks or whatever Ks or whatever numbers you have, I've lost it all. He says, yet, yet. Here's his perspective. I will rejoice in the Lord my God. Amen. Even if I lose everything. Because my perspective of God is that he's good to me. Habakkuk would say, my, my perspective of my God is that he will always provide for me the verse that was read by Pastor John. He's never going to leave me. He, he promised me. He's not going to turn his back on me. I don't know how it's going to work. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, the things that have happened to me, they've only served to advance the gospel. What perspective is that? If I was writing that, it wouldn't read that. It would read something like this. The things that happened to me, have made me a very bitter man. The things that happened to me have made me that I don't trust anybody. I don't believe anybody. That's my perspective. But a Christian that has intimate fellowship with their Lord and is trusting in their Lord and knows that God loves them God knows them, and God is with them, and God is working everything out for their good. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah, but what, how is this going to, I, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work out. But see, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking at this through worldly lens. I'm looking at this situation through the lens of heaven about your perspective. And, and so, so Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, my perspective, the things that have happened to me, all they've done is it's served to advance the gospel. That, that's his perspective. And, and then he goes on to verse 12 and he tells us what kind of impact that can have. Look with me at verse 12. He says, let me read this from verse 12 and then we'll go to 13. I want you to know, brothers, that the things, and you could write, uh, you could fill out that blank, what that means, your things that have happened to you, they've actually turned out to be for the furtherance of the gospel, verse 13, so that it has become evident, please notice that, people can see things, it has become evident to who? The non-Christian people. It's become evident to the palace guard and to all the rest that my chains 
are in Christ. I wrote it this way. How you handle problems can be a powerful testimony. Amen. See, if your perspective is right, you know that people are watching you. And you know that if you are a Christian and your goal, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, if your goal is to be pleasing to the Lord, it's not just about you. It's about your witness. It's about your example. Paul says it's become evident to the whole palace guards. It has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So Paul is handling his difficulty. Paul is handling his trial. His test is becoming a testimony so that the non-Christian world is looking on at how this Christian is handling his life and saying, wow, you're different. You know, uh, Rob... Uh, read that verse from Acts chapter 16. It's part of what, one of the things I want to talk to you about. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas pull into the city of Philippi, and as they're going into the city of Philippi, there's this demon-possessed girl uh, 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 saying things that finally the apostle Paul gets tired of it, and he turns around, and he drives the demon out of the demon-possessed girl, and she comes to her senses, and she's healed. You would think, like, hey, great job, great job. No, the people, they, they, so there were some people that actually owned this girl. She used to be a fortune teller and used to make money for them. They, they don't like that Paul has robbed her of that gift. So instead of cheering for Paul, what do they do? They drag him and Silas through the city. Now picture this. You have helped somebody. You have done something good for somebody. And the way they repay you is to mistreat you. How do you handle that? What's your perspective? And not only that, but it gets worse. They've drug, you know, like in the cowboy movies, have you ever seen that when the, the cowboy's on the horse and they put the rope around the horn of the saddle and they tie the guy up and they hit the horse and they're dragging the guy through the dirt. The, Paul and Silas are getting dragged through the dirt, beards and uh, mud and blood and torn clothes. And they pick him up and they bring him in front of the marketplace and they strip them naked. What do you do with that? How do you handle that? Are you angry? Are you bitter? Are you hateful? They're standing there. These men, they're teaching us customs that are not right, uh, lawful for us to follow. Lies. All they did was help a girl who was demon-possessed. They're talking trash about Paul and Silas. What do you do with that? Somebody's talking trash about you. They're lying about you. They're making you out to be a a bad person, what do you do with that? What's your perspective? Is there anything in the back of your mind that you go, I bet you there's a pony in here. <laughs> you may have to keep digging. You may have to keep digging, but I, I bet you, because my God loves me, my God knows me, my God's with me, and he's working everything out for my good, I bet you there's a pony in here. And then, strip naked. They take a two-by-four and they begin to club them with two-by-fours. And after they had beat them with two-by-fours, they take their fist and they begin to pummel them with their fist. Ain't done nothing wrong, man. All we did was help somebody. Is that fair? Is that right, what you're doing to me? What's your perspective? And after that, they take them after they're bloodied. They've got the black eyes and the swollen faces and beards matted with mud and blood and hair sticking everywhere. They throw them down into a dungeon and they put them in stocks. And there they are. What's your perspective? 
I know what, what my perspective with me would be. I'd look over at Silas and go, another fine mess you got us into. <laughs> God, this is, a, this is how you repay me? This is what you do for somebody that did the right thing? There's something inside of Paul. To me, it seems, that he has such a deep love for God. And he's such, he has such intimate, close, personal fellowship with God that he can still see God in the test. I can still see you. You're here. You haven't left me. You haven't abandoned me. And so he looks over at Silas with these black and blue faces and matted beard. <laughs> and he goes, Silas, you want to sing a song? <laughs> and at midnight, at midnight, at the darkest time, at the darkest time of day, they're singing hymns to God. But it's not just about them. You see, the Bible says that the other prisoners were listening to them. They had heard a lot of other things in the past, but they had never heard somebody singing worship songs. And there's a jailer that hears them singing. And as they're singing, the prison doors, their worship opens the prison doors, but they're still standing there, and the jailer comes, and he says to them, what must I do to be saved? Why did he say that? Because how they handled their problem. How the unfair, unjust, difficult, traumatic experience they went through because of how they handled it, a non-Christian person looked on and said, you guys are real. You you really believe that? I got to have that. Tell me, what, what do I need to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Hey, come home with me. Paul goes home with them. Wife's there cooking up some tortillas and frijoles. And <laughs> Paul comes in with silence and they sit down. He shares the gospel. The whole family gets saved. One day you're going to meet a Philippian jailer in heaven and a Mrs. Philippian jailer and a bunch of little Philippian jailers. And they're going to say to you, do you know why we're here? Because there was a time that we listened to two men that were beaten and bloody and they kept their perspective and they worshipped God when worshiping God was the last thing they wanted to do, but they worshiped their God in the midst of the trial, and it touched me so much that today I'm in heaven. I want that. I'm far from it, but I want that life. Non-Christians are watching. It's not just about you. It's not just about your world. It's not just about your problems. It's not just about the difficulties that you face. There's non-Christians that are watching. But there's somebody else watching. The last verse, verse 13, there's somebody else watching. Verse 14, I'm sorry, verse 14. Verse 13, so it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Look at verse 14. And most of the brothers, Christians, in the Lord have become confident. How? By my chains. And they are much more confident by my chains, more confident to, and bold to speak the word without fear. 
I wrote it this way, how you handle problems can even impact other Christians. Not just the non-Christian world. Do you know that your brothers, your sisters in the Lord, like you, are going through some serious troubles? A lot of our brothers and sisters are still dealing with some of the after effects of COVID. Job losses, business losses. Some of your Christian brothers and sisters are struggling with rebellious children. Some of your brothers and sisters are wondering if their marriage is going to make it. Some of your brothers and sisters are wondering, does God love me? They could use you. They, they, they need you. You're that person that a Christian that is going through some difficult times in their life, they can look at you because you've had the right perspective. Because your test has become a testimony. It's possible that a Christian would look at you and say, if God can do that for you, I have hope. I have hope that he can do that for me. Be an encouragement. Not, it's not just about you. It's about you to have the right perspective, but that it impacts other people, the non-Christians, that they would get saved. That the way you handle your difficulties and the perspective, the right perspective that you have would be an encouragement to the Christians. We need encouragement. I've never had a, one single person in the however many years, the last hundred years that I've been in ministry, I've never had anybody, met nobody, come to me and say, listen, I don't, I've had enough encouragement. I don't need any more. Please, I can't take it anymore. I've never had anybody say that to me. Especially now. You know, yesterday as we, as I sat with the, I sat, as I taught the, the man, I, I, I taught to him about end times, how the nearness of the return of Christ. Things that are happening globally in Russia and China and Israel and Lebanon and Korea. And I said to them, we need to keep encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching, the day of Christ. Step outside of yourself and be an encouragement to somebody. Let me leave you with four thoughts for you to ponder. Ponder this. Dare to trust, number one, dare to trust that God's hand is involved in your situation. Take that step of faith. Verbalize it. Say it. God, I trust that you're, you're here. I don't see you. I don't hear you, but I trust that you are here. Dare to, dare to trust that. Secondly, decide. Decide that God is good. Don't let your situation, don't let your trauma, don't let your storm determine to you whether God is good or not. No, God is good. He is loving. He has your best interest at heart. Determine that. Decide that. And don't let your situation change that view. Thirdly, difficult times. Difficult times are nothing more than just friends that have come to help you draw close to God. Consider it pure joy, my friends, whenever you face different kinds of trials. Knowing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. They're your friends. The Lord allows things to come into your life, not to destroy you, but to bring you to a place of closer intimacy with him. Lastly, 
The devil's desire is to have you harden your heart during the difficulties. Tragically, my brothers, sisters, I have seen too many of my Christian family walk away from God because they couldn't believe that God would allow those things to happen. And I understand the pain. I understand the disappointment. But they opened up the door to the lies of the enemy. And because they believed the lies of the enemy, if God really loved you, God doesn't do that to other people. God has it out for you. Yeah. Enemy, enemy, thank you for that counsel because that, that, that makes sense. Don't listen to that. You're loved. You're very loved. The shed blood of Jesus Christ is proof that he loves you. He who did not give us, he who gave us his own son, he who did not spare his own son, will he not freely give us all things? He loves you. Amen.